Amen. You may be seated. I guess you can open your Bibles to the book of Luke. Excuse me. Book of Luke. <clears throat> Been trying to do a type of uh, some, uh, a New Testament survey. And uh, I got to thinking. I thought, well, maybe I spent too much time with Mark, but I don't think so. And then more got to thinking about it. So we'll. I'm not going to cover one book a week, so don't worry about that, uh, I don't think anyway. <clears throat> but we will spend some time with the book of Luke uh, this morning, and then uh, as we get through to the book of Acts, and then on through Paul's epistles, it should speed up a little bit. But i um, trying to give you an overview. Context or the time frame in God's calendar where you're at in time, or the prophetic calendar, and all that kind of thing. And you need to understand that doctrinally, and then, of course, mark uh, how it portrays Christ as a servant. And went through the book of Mark in almost every chapter, if, if not every chapter. You can see that with Jesus Christ <clears throat> and um, how he's constantly serving and how his his genealogy is not even given in Mark as it's given in Matthew. Of course, a genealogy of a king, it's not given in, in Mark. And, of course, because he's a servant. But then you pick up the book of Luke. And you pick up the book of Luke, and then you'll find his genealogy again. And um, we'll talk about that more in just a minute. But, but the book of Luke, <clears throat> the book of Luke has 24 chapters, 24 chapters in it. It has 1,151 verses, and it has 25,000, if I got this correct, 25,944 words. It took me a while to count those. I'm just kidding. I didn't count them. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you was awake today. Amen. <laughs> but uh, that's the records and what I've got, 25,944 uh, words, a couple different sources, but, but nonetheless, the book of Luke is, mentioned this last week, the book of Luke is the longest book in the New Testament. Uh, it surpasses Matthew and the book of Acts. Most people think Matthew or Acts is usually the longest book, but it's not. Uh, uh, the book of Luke is the longest book uh, in the New Testament. Uh, the book of Luke was written by Luke. Uh, himself, and of course Luke being a physician, Luke uh, traveled with Paul and was Paul's personal physician, so Luke got to experience and eyewitness a lot of things uh, uh, that God was doing at that time as far as the gospel being preached to the Gentiles, and that's why you'll pick up the book of Luke, you get to Luke 19, it has a Gentile uh, flavor or wording in it and that kind of thing. And uh, some other places, Luke chapter 4 mentions some things over there about that. But Luke was a physician. And interestingly enough, Luke um, records the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's important um, because so many people today don't believe it and the devil would like to steal that from you and have you not to believe it. Uh, I'll tell you this, that is, that is a miraculous birth, there's no question, uh, a vir the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> that's just, uh, it's an amazing, an amazing thing to me, but without, without the virgin birth of Christ, we might as well close our book, pack it up, and go home. So why? Because Jesus Christ was a normal man, if that's the case, we know it's not the case, but if... He was a normal man. He was not virgin born. He did not have God's blood. He would have had his father's blood, if you, whoever you want to call that, Joseph or whoever. He would have had his father's blood, but, but he did have his father's blood. <laughs> he had God the Father's blood. Come with me to Acts. What is that, Acts 20? Come with me to Acts 20. I'll show you this. Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> Jesus Christ had God's blood flowing through his veins. You say, what do you mean? It was untainted 
It was, it was sinless. It was undefiled. It was pure. Uh, that's why it's a, you get, well, let's read the verse and we'll think about it a little bit. Look at verse 28. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which He, God, hath purchased, or Christ, hath purchased with His own blood. The context here is God, God in the flesh. We hath purchased with His own blood. Jesus Christ had God's blood. Amen. And um, that's the blood that was shed there. You know, it's interestingly, interestingly enough you know, if they'd have tried to hang Jesus Christ, they couldn't have killed him. <laughs> Isn't that weird? What? He had to shed his blood. That blood had to come out of that body. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus Christ doesn't even die until he dismisses his own spirit. <laughs> you talk about total control while he's hanging on that cross. He says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And boom, and out it comes. That's where he dies. If he hadn't have done he could have hung there forever. <laughs> you can't kill God. He allowed himself to die. Matter of fact, he said, all right, it's time to die. And out, out the soul and spirit comes. That's a weird thing. Bible, what, come to Luke, uh, Acts 2. Look, look at Acts 2. Interesting thing. Talk, uh, talking along the lines here of the virgin birth of Christ. He was unlike any other man that's ever walked this earth. But yet he was 100% man. He was 100% God. I think it's Acts 2. Maybe it's Acts 1. Where is that where he says, uh, Thou shalt not see, uh, suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Is that Acts 2? Uh, yeah, Acts 2, look at verse 26 and 27. Well, back up to 25. For David, Acts 2, 25. Um, he's talking about Jesus Christ down through here. They crucified him in 23. God raised him in 24. Look at verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. 26, therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Christ's soul went down to hell. <coughs> neither, will thou, neither will thou suffer thine holy one, that's Christ, to see corruption. When his body, <laughs> his, he dies, his spirit leaves, his soul leaves, goes down to hell. His body is put in a tomb. You realize, you, my goodness, your, soul, your, your flesh is dying right now. It's dying. Um, as we age, it, it's dying. Some people die sooner than others or later than others or whatever you want to say. But, but right now, your body is, is corrupt. It stinks. If you don't bathe it for a couple of days, it stinks. That's why you perfume it. And you deodorize it. And you scrub it. And I'm glad you do. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. And as soon as you die, the worms and the parasites and all that bacteria that's in your body, they go, whoo it's party time. And they start feasting. You know, they didn't do that to the Lord's body. Often makes you wonder if he ever had to use deodorant. Well, the way they didn't have it back then. You understand what I'm saying? You ever think about that kind of stuff? Man, I wonder if he had to brush his teeth. You don't take care of your teeth, you'll, it'll rot out. You'll, it'll, it'll, what, they'll decay, right? So, well, it, I'm just getting you to think a little bit. He had God's blood flowing through his veins. The life of the flesh is where? It's in the blood. I wonder if he ever got a cold. I wonder if he ever got sick. 
You ever think about that stuff? What's the first thing when something's wrong with you? What, you go to the doctor and say, okay, we need to draw a little blood here. Don't they? They're going to find out what's wrong with you. I wonder if, I'm, of course, you know, I mean, the Lord, so well, he probably a, pic, a picture of perfect health and all that stuff. Well, I mean, obviously he was um, healthy and physically fit to endure what he endured. But, but I mean, he was a kid. Right? Amen. Kids swap spit and germs and who knows what else, right? I mean, snot and everything else. Give me that toy. Right? He had brothers and sisters. Did he not? Amen. If, you, if you will, uh, uh, you could say, whatever you want to call that, half-sisters and brothers. He had siblings. I don't know how sooner or later they came along, but uh, man, I'm sure they, you know, was around one another, and uh, you know, in, in the world we live in today, they were breathing the same air. <laughs> I'm sure he didn't wear a mask. He had God's blood. Unlike anything you've ever seen. Come back to the book of Luke. And uh, so uh, this, this book, uh, obviously we'll get more to that. Uh, deal more than maybe that virgin birth when we get to the book of John. But Luke here, the reason I point that out is the book of Luke is recorded by a medical doctor. This isn't some, this isn't some fluke or blind faith or, or anything, you know, uh, just an emotional a religious roller coaster ride where a bunch of people are just hopping on the religious bandwagon and you know no this is a medical doctor sitting back looking at this going hmm let me think about this a minute for for a second and he writes it down <laughs> what an interesting thing it is um he 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 writes here and addresses this Theophilus. Um, Brother Hoffman says here, very well could have been a Roman um, uh, 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 a person of uh, what's a, a prominence because of the, the, um, the salutation that he gives him. Most excellent Theophilus, uh, Theophilus. You'll find this also over in the book of Acts chapter 1. Uh, I think it's verse 1 or 2 there. And uh, makes you wonder if this man, uh, some way, somehow, was trying to uh, search for the truth and wanted to know about this man, Jesus Christ. And so Luke records it. And um, look at that thing there, verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. I mean, Luke's saying, I got a handle on some of this. This isn't just some fairy tale, this isn't folklore. I got an understanding of this from the very first, all the way back to this, all the way back to his con uh, conception, <laughs> if you will. First to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. And then he, what's he do? He, you pick up the book of Luke, it records his birth. You'll pick up the uh, account there of him uh, 12 years old in the temple, um, astonishing the doctors and all those fellows. And then uh, uh, he picks up his ministry and the rest of his life. The whole thing is in order there. And uh, look at verse 4. That thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So evidently this fellow had heard some things, seen some things, had been instructed, been taught some things. I don't know. But uh, Luke here, uh, boy, he, I mean... Uh, he gives it to him, 24 chapters worth, from birth to death and resurrection, and uh, gives it all to him. All right, so Luke, uh, he's the recorder. Uh, the date of the writing is about 63 A.D., about 63 A.D., the date of the writing, not the, of the events, but the date of the writing is about 63 A.D. That's a, that's a little bit, actually, that's about average. If you, uh, you look at that, the, of all the books in the New Testament, obviously 27 books, I think it's about 19 of them, 
not to be exact, 19 of those books was written in the uh, 5th, 6th, maybe the 6th, 5th and 6th centuries, if not the 6th and 7th. And uh, some was written early, some was written a little bit later, but uh, obviously John's was later and all that. But Luke there, he records about the same time the rest of these guys are writing in those uh, couple of centuries there. So that's, uh, that's when it's written. Uh, let's see. Uh, Luke, again, portrays Christ as the Son of Man, the Son of Man. You'll find that 26 times, that phrase will pop up 26 times in the book, uh, Son of Man. This has two, um, denotes two things. I say, what is it? Number one, it uh, obviously denotes His manhood. We talked a little bit about that already, but Christ, Christ uh, was a man, uh, Paul writes about him, and he calls him the man Christ Jesus. There's one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. He was a man. He was an actual figure in history. They try to change all this stuff today and try to change the B.C. to, to uh, what is it, before com B.C.E., before common uh, era. It's, a, it's an error is what it is. Uh, but but anything they can do to get rid of Jesus Christ. He is an actual person who walked this earth, who is an actual person who is seated at the right hand of God today. And uh, I'll say this, this Son of Man was the central figure of all the ages. This, this Son of Man, being the central figure of all the ages, had more of an impact on the world in just three and a half years if you want to say 33 and a half years, but basically his ministry, 33 and a half years than any other man that's ever lived. He's had more influence. He's had more sway. Um, uh, uh, Jesus Christ has affected more uh, effect on the world than any other man that's ever lived. Hands down, bar none. All the great ones, if they weren't saved, they come and go, they, 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 they're born, they live, they die, and if they were lost, they went to hell. What's the big deal of what they... doesn't matter anything. But Jesus Christ, this Son of Man, uh, this common, if you will, who comes, we saw that with Mark, comes portraying himself, uh, showing himself a servant, just a common, ordinary carpenter's son, uh, there was no, uh, read over in Isaiah about him, no commonness found in him, just an average looking ordinary Jew. <laughs> Looked no different than the common peasants of the day. The Prince of Glory, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. And um, that's him. And that thing shows up 26 times and it denotes his manhood. All right, secondly, it denotes the second advent. Whenever you find that phrase, Son of Man, you'll usually find a reference to the second advent, not the rapture, but the second advent of Jesus Christ. That's important. That's an important doctrinal thing that you need to remember. That thing will show up consistently, and it'll be Son of Man, Son of Man, Son of Man. And uh, just as the kingdom of heaven denotes the second advent and all that versus the kingdom of God, uh, as a standard rule, that Son of Man uh, will denote the second advent. And so you'll see a lot of that pop up uh, in the book of Luke. Uh, so uh, Luke portrays him as the Son of Man. Luke also portrays him as the perfect man. We've already, I guess, commented on some of that, but he was. He was the perfect man. You don't know any perfect men. I don't. Outside of him. I know some good men. Don't get me wrong. But I don't know any perfect men. When I say perfect, I don't, I don't even just necessarily mean uh, sinless. I don't know any personally. The Bible talks about uh, Job being perfect and upright and all that kind of thing. But it didn't, wasn't sinless. had to do with his walk and with, with God and his living and those kind of things. But he, it wasn't sinless. He was perfect maybe in his character and in some of those kind of things. But, but, he, but Jesus Christ was perfect in all points. The Bible says he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. I mean, he was perfect from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Uh, the perfect man. Luke portrays him as this, the perfect man. Luke is an historical book. It gives the accounts. 
Uh, again, it mentions you have the Gentile flavor to it. Some, so much so that some would say that Luke was a Gentile. I don't believe that. I believe all the writers of this book are, are uh, Jewish. Uh, but nonetheless. Uh, then you have um, the connection there with uh, uh, the prophetic uh, business of the branch that I gave you uh, three or four weeks ago, whenever it was, about Jesus Christ being called the branch and how I gave four different references and each one of those references matched up with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Luke's reference was Zechariah 6, verse 12, and it says, the, and the, the word in there is the man whose name was or is the branch. And that's Jesus Christ. He's portrayed as the Son of Man, as, as a man. All right, uh, let's see here. It records his lineage. Uh, you pick up chapter 1, chapter, uh, what is it, chapter 1 here? Yeah, chapter 1, or 2. Where is it there? It records his lineage from, from, um, from Mary, chapter 3 there, I'm sorry, chapter 3. Uh, all the way back, all the way back to Adam. And, um, boy, that's interesting to me. I've heard of some people tracing their lineage way, 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 way back. But I don't know of anybody trace that thing all the way back to uh, Adam personally. But good night, man, that's a long ways back there. Uh, but Jesus Christ here, His lineage is traced all the way. And this thing here is through, is through, uh, through a woman. And the interesting thing about that is, uh, most of the time when you pick up the Bible, even in the book of Matthew, it's, it's all through, uh, obviously through men and all that, but it starts here uh, with Mary's lineage. Uh, so what's, what's so interesting about that? Obviously it's a virgin birth. Come to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, you know what's in Genesis 3. You have the fall of man, Adam and Eve, and the, uh, the man and the woman and the serpent are there in the garden, and the, and the Lord comes down, and He shows up, and um, He deals with the, the matter at hand here. And He's handing down a uh, sentence, I guess, making judgment, passing judgment. And notice there in verse... Uh, he find, verse 11, he inquires. They fess up there. Verse 12, 13. <clears throat> Notice verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. 15. Here's a, here's a key verse. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. The woman has no seed. Right? Amen. She gets that from the man. Right. And we don't have no need to go into all the biology of all that, but uh, you, you get the point there. So it's, but it says there, and that's no error. Amen. It's no error at all. Right. That's prophecy is what that is. You got God giving prophecy in Genesis chapter 3 about someone who's going to come. Amen. <laughs> and it's his son. It's the Son of Man and the Son of God. But look, and I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, that's the devil's head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Another prophecy. Second, that, and that prophecy there is second advent. All right, but he's got to come first. All right, we've been through all that, and we're not running all the references on that. So the devil, the devil picks up on that just like that. All right, so, so up shows a man named Adam, right? The, if you will, the first Adam. And he's got a, a wife with him. And there they are in the garden, and Adam is king over all the earth. And the devil looks at that, and he says... This ain't going to last, and I'm going to see to it. The devil has already fallen, correct? And he's lost his throne, which he did have. And he lost all that, Genesis 1-1, Genesis, between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. 
judgment was, was placed upon him and, and executed, and he lost that reign. God recreates, puts man there, and the devil's back in the shadow looking at a new king who was made a little lower than the angels, according to the book of Hebrews, and, which is what the devil, a cherub, the, or so-called the angel of light, if you will. And the devil looks at that and he says, I can't stand this. Jesus, uh, Adam is, a, is an express image of Jesus Christ. He's a son of God in a perfect body. And so the devil plans his attack and he moves in through the weaker vessel. It doesn't make any difference what, what all this crowd says about men versus women, women versus men, whatever. The devil came through that woman to get to that man, period. That's what he did. And it worked. Nonetheless, he got the king overthrown, right? Adam lost his crown. So everything comes, comes to a, a slow grinding halt right here. <laughs> but then God says this, I'll put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. And he's going to bruise your head, but you'll bruise his heel. What? In other words, there's going to be a Messiah that comes. And he's going to be a king. And he's going to bruise your head. He's going to thump your head and take the crown back. Yeah, that's what Christ is going to do when He comes back at the second advent. What's He going to be? He's going to rule and reign. He's going to be king of kings. All right, so right off the bat, the devil knows that there's a Messiah coming. You can, what is that cross-reference to Romans 16 or whatever that is over there? I forget now, but he knows there's a Messiah coming. He knows there's a prophecy given, but he don't... Uh, they don't know much more about it than that. So what happens in Genesis 4? Two boys show up, and they're the, uh, Adam and Eve, what? They have children, Cain, Abel. And the devil says, that promise was through the seed. So you know what I'll do? I'll get rid of the seed. I'll take him out. So he uses Cain. And he kills Abel right off the bat. You ever, you ever look at that and go, what in the world is going on? I mean, what? that's what's going on. The devil's back there whispering in his ear and using him. And from here on out, the fight is on. The fight is on. And you'll find that thing showing up. There's a battle. There's a battle there for that seed. You can see that. That line, if you will, that physical line coming all the way through. And you can see the devil constantly attacking it, constantly attacking it, constantly attacking it. What's he do? He gives the promise to Abraham. And what's the devil doing? Trying to attack that seed, attack that seed, attack that seed. That thing comes all the way through. That's why when you read about all those kings and all that stuff, the devil's after, those, after that line. He's after that seed constantly. So much so that you get down, what, some four or five hundred years before Christ shows up and you get a man named Jeconiah or Kaniah. God hated him so bad and he was of that line of, from Judah and right up through that lineage and, uh, 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 of the line of Christ, if you will, and, but that man was so wicked that God removes the J-E off of it and calls him Kaniah. You know what he does? He curses him and he says, none of his seed is going to sit on my throne from here on out, period. Well, that's the lineage of Christ. <laughs> and the only way to get around that is to be virgin born. And I don't know, uh, uh, evidently the devil missed it or just God just said, step back, you ain't stopping me from doing anything. <laughs> I'm bringing him into the world and this is how I'm going to do it. That's why when he's born, they're saying, Hosanna, the, you know, and all that stuff, and glory to God in the highest, and they're looking for that king. And all, why? Because he was there, Amen. irregardless of the line. 
But that whole thing, that whole thing, Luke records that. That's an, important, that's an important thing to show that that thing comes through Mary because that is a fulfillment of Scripture in Genesis 3, verse 15. Without it, you lose it. All right, so you have that. Um, let's see. I already gave you the thing that records Christ that is 12-year-old in the temple and all that kind of thing. Let's look at some verses. We're going to run out of time here. Let's look at a few verses that are, that are changed. Changed, omitted, fooled with, messed with. <clears throat> and I say, why do you do that? Because this is God's book. And you need to know where some of these places are. Look with me, if you would, in Luke chapter 2. Look in Luke chapter 2. Here's a common one that's been preached and taught here for, I guess, many years. But look at Luke chapter 2, verse uh, 33. Luke 2, 33. Notice what the King James Bible says. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken uh, of him. A lot of the new Bibles, I don't know about all, but a lot of the new Bibles will take the word Joseph out of there. They'll remove Joseph and they'll put the child's father and mother in place of that. You say, well, that's not a very big deal. Yes, it is. It attacks the deity of Christ. What the Holy Spirit is showing you there is that Joseph was not his father, not his biological father. Whatever you want to call that, stepdad, whatever, I don't know. But uh, he certainly was not his biological father. And if you remove that, that would leave you or lead you even to believe that Joseph could have been his father. You say, well, you're, you're splitting a hair. No, you're missing the point. That's a big deal. The virgin birth, again, is a big deal. When you attack the virgin birth, you attack the deity of Jesus Christ. I can think of one person in particular who would love to do that and to pull the wool over somebody's face and eyes where they can't see or deceive them or just plant a little seed. Well, just maybe. I can remember in Luke chapter 4 and also in Matthew 3 or 4 where this fifth cherub, the devil, shows up and he says, If you're the Son of God. If you're the Son of God? He knew who he was dealing with. You know what that was? That was a smack in the mouth. That's what it was. I can hear uh, the devil hissing behind those Pharisees and Sadducees accusing Jesus Christ of being a bastard son. We be not born of fornication in John chapter 8. They knew who Jesus Christ was. They knew the genealogy. They had it. They could have looked it up. Those scribes could have looked it up. They knew it. All right, so you got new Bibles that are attacking uh, the deity of Christ. I don't want a Bible. I don't care how easy it is to understand, and it's not easy. I don't care how easy they say it is to understand. I don't want a Bible that attacks my Savior's deity. Period. I have no use for it. All right, look at verse, look at verse, uh, what do I want? Verse uh, 43. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Again, the Holy Spirit is careful to protect the fact that Jesus Christ was virgin born and that Joseph was not his father. You ought to learn to compare Scripture with Scripture. All right, notice with me, notice with me in Luke uh, 23. Luke 23. Now, I'm going to give you three or four here, but there's more than that. One, one of these cases ought to be enough to where you ought to take your NIV or your New King James and pitch it unless you want to use it to just uh, learn what, what the mistakes are. And, and I, you can do that, uh, but uh, know and understand that um, it is not the perfect Word of God. Luke 23, notice with me verse 42. And what you have here is the two thieves on the cross, Jesus Christ in the middle, 
they're crucified, and they're hanging there, and this one thief here, he repents, basically, and he's trying to get some things right with God. He knows he's going out to meet his Maker, and he's heard some things about this man, Jesus Christ, and he wises up here, and notice what he says. He rebukes the other fellow for railing on Christ, and then in verse 42, he said unto Jesus, Lord, what does Romans 10 say? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart, Lord, he's the Lord. Reference to God again. All right, he says here, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's, that's a beautiful thing to me. All that agony and pain and blood and moaning and all that, and the Lord takes time right there to save that man. That's an amazing thing to me. But nonetheless, what they do is, and many of you know, they remove the word Lord there. They take it out. Why would you do that? That's a means of salvation. <laughs> Can't you see the serpent behind all that? He's trying to damn everyone he can to hell. You see, you need every word of God. You need every word. You've got to have Every word, which takes me to um, come to Luke 4. Don't remove not even one. I haven't done it for some time, but occasionally we'll examine the NIV and some other of these perversions and point out all the references that they mess with and fool with and change and all that. And, um, you know, and it's been said, and I guess it's true that uh, you can take a Bible like that and you can lead somebody to Jesus Christ. You can. You can. But if you don't have to, don't. But here's the thing. You can also take one of those Bibles and you can damn someone to hell with it too. By mistake. And I don't, listen, this book right here, uh, don't get me wrong, in one sense, it'll save you or damn you. Because it'll pass sentence and judgment on you, but but it ain't you you and you got to be you better learn how to rightly divide it and all that. But when you start messing with uh, like uh, what is it Acts chapter eight over there, and you start uh, teaching that Gentiles or a Jew or whatever in this dispensation can be baptized for salvation, that'll damn somebody to hell. Believe in some words that somebody calls a Bible. And that's, that's dangerous business. What is it? You met, they mess with the words. Don't, one little word, Lord. Leave it alone. Just don't touch it. Leave it alone. Look in Luke 4, 4. Luke 4, 4. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. They'll, they'll, they'll omit, but by every word of God. They'll take it out. Why would you do that? God wants you to have every Every last little word, every one. All right, come to uh, Luke 24. Luke 24, I've got to wind up here. Luke 24, I'll give you two more references here. Just, a, just an overview here, a look at the book of Luke. Luke 24, notice verse uh, 51. Obviously, this is after he has risen from the dead, and uh, he's, he's here a short time. He's getting ready to ascend back to heaven, but, but prior to that, verse 15, he led them out as far as to Bethany and lifted up his uh, hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. You know what they remove? And they worshiped him. Well, it's not in the oldest and best manuscripts. Okay, you got two. They won't tell you that it's in the majority of manuscripts. Yeah. Amen. Besides that, uh, who, who tries to steal worship from Jesus Christ? The devil does. We 
pointed that out before, you can go through the Gospels and you can find every time where Jesus Christ would do a miracle and you'd read where they, and they all came together and glorified God. Bam, here comes an unclean spirit still in the show. Getting everybody's eyes off of it's a constant, it's a constant uh, attack. It's a constant occurrence. That thing goes on. The, the, devil, the devil desires, I know there's different teaching on that, and I agree, but the devil does desire worship. He does want to keep you from worshiping God. If he can deceive you and get you worshiping your own mind, yourself and man, he will. But uh, he does desire worship, and he wants that. And if he can steal it from God, he will. All right, one more place, and we'll call it a morning. Come to Luke 1. Those are some places where uh, the book is attacked. There's many, many more, but I'll leave those for now. Uh, look in Luke uh, chapter 1. This one here, we've been, made much of the virgin birth this morning. And you'll notice we haven't uh, said a whole lot about Mary. Now, I'll say this. Mary gets a bad rap <laughs> because of what the Catholics have done, because of what the Baalites have done. She, you know, she, uh, we look at her almost as, almost as a, a, a bad guy sometimes. Well, that Mary is not the Mary of the Bible. The Mary they worship is not the, Bi the Mary of the Bible. This, miss, this Mary was a good woman. A very good woman. Um, I don't have the verse marked there. Um... Where the, the Lord commends her. Anyway, that's not the one I'm looking for anyhow. But uh, God does uh, highly commend her. Where is it? You got it there? 26, 27? No. Oh, well, she's highly favored. Look at verse 28. 32? Is that 32? Yeah, you can see all the way down through. Look at, look at 28, an angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, uh, and the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou. Notice it says among women. Yeah. Among. Above or among? among? If I'm not mistaken, there's a lady back in the Old Testament. I might be wrong in this. You might want to check me. Her name is J.L. She's blessed above women. Yeah. Mary here is uh, uh, among women. That's interesting. But where am I going with that? I'm just simply saying this. Mary was a sinner. She was a sinner, and she knew it. She knew she needed a Savior. There's a good verse you can show a Catholic. You don't even have to fight with them and argue them, tell them how stupid they are, and all that kind of stuff. You just say, hey, man, you know Mary was a sinner? And, of course, they'll think you're blasphemy. That's blasphemous. They say, wait a minute, according to the Bible... Look what she said out of her, look, look, look at the words that came out of her own mouth. And you flip over here to Luke 1, and you get down to verse, um, oh, verse 46. 46. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, my, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. <laughs> she recognizes she needs um, a Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And, and, they, and she was blessed. But she's not to be worshipped. At all. And you read different accounts where the Lord, uh, he makes that known. And she takes the lower place. Versus what you always see in the pictures with the Catholics. They always have Mary above Christ. Nine times out of ten, most of the time. All right, so that's just some, uh, we'll stop right there. That's just an overview of the, of the book of Luke. We'll stop right there. Take a break.